Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sierra Lamar? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, and offer my analysis. Sierra Lamar was born on October 19, 1996, and grew up in Fremont, California. This is about a half hour north of San Jose. Sierra's father, Steve, and her mother, Marlene, divorced. Sometime around November 2011, Sierra and her mother moved to Morgan Hill, California. They lived there with Marlene's new boyfriend. Morgan Hill is about 50 minutes southeast of Fremont. In 2023, the personal finance website WalletHub named Fremont as the happiest city in the United States. So Sierra was leaving a very happy city and going to Morgan Hill, which in theory would be somewhat less happy. I'm a bit skeptical about the methodology used in the WalletHub study. For example, Jersey City, New Jersey was ranked number 32. The only time I've ever heard of the word happy and Jersey City used in the same sentence is when someone says, I'm really happy to be getting out of Jersey City. Either way, it's not surprising that Sierra was not pleased with moving. She left behind all that happiness. It appears as though Sierra may have been trying to recapture some of that happiness or maybe compensate for other problems by using substances. She used marijuana and ecstasy. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Guardio. Guardio is like your online bodyguard that keeps you safe from scams, malware, and phishing attempts. It's a browser extension that detects threats before they can cause harm, such as installing malware, tracking what you do, and even stealing your identity. These days, when scams have become a lot more sophisticated than most think, people can fall for them on search engines and social media. Guardio is the only tool that knows how to detect and block these threats. Simply add the Guardio extension from the Chrome or Edge store, to get started. When you install it, you get a free security scan, and this is when you find out if your information has already been compromised or if your browser contains any existing threats. After completing the scan, you can continue to get a seven-day free trial to remove those threats and also enable real-time protection. This is what makes Guardio unique. Unlike other programs, it stops all threats before they can even get on your computer. Their identity monitoring features are cross-platform, so if you sign up through your mobile device, you'll also get real-time alerts. One Guardio account covers five family members at no extra cost. Plus, my community gets 20% off the monthly subscription. So that's a great deal if you want to keep your family and yourself protected from scams. Go to guard.io slash Dr. Grande. The link is in the description. And check out their affordable premium plan for full protection. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Friday, March 16, 2012, Marlene left the family home in Morgan Hill at 6 a.m. to go to her job as a physical therapist. Her boyfriend had already left the house by this time. Before Marlene left, she saw that Sierra was in her room. At 7 a.m., Sierra took a selfie and posted it on social media. At 7.11 a.m., Sierra sent a text message to a friend arranging to compare homework. It's not clear what the purpose of this comparison was, Perhaps this indicated some type of academic dishonesty. But either way, the nature of this communication was not out of the ordinary for Sierra. After saying this message, Sierra ceased all activity on social media. This was out of the ordinary. Typically, Sierra would leave her house at about 7.15 a.m. and walk a few blocks to the bus stop, which was at the intersection of Palm Avenue and Dougherty Avenue. Sierra was the only student who used that bus stop. The bus would arrive at 7.24 a.m. and take her to school. The bus arrived on time that day, but Sierra was not at the bus stop. After work, Sierra's mother Marlene called her, but there was no answer. Marlene arrived home and searched the house. Sierra was not there. At 6 p.m., Marlene received an automated email from Sierra's school indicating that Sierra was absent that day. After calling a few people to see if they knew where Sierra was, Marlene called the police. Initially, the police did not appear to be too worried. There was no evidence of foul play at this point, and Sierra had told friends that she wanted to run away. Some people believed that perhaps she returned to Fremont. 
The next day, March 17, the police became more concerned. A massive search effort was initiated. At 3.45 p.m., Sierra's cell phone pinged a cell tower half a mile north of her house. A search team was sent to that area. They found the phone in a field not far from the road, as if it had been thrown from a motor vehicle. The phone had sent a signal because liquid had entered it. On March 18, search teams found items belonging to Sierra near a shed about two miles from her house. The items included her purse, school books, shoes, socks, underwear, pants, and a sweatshirt. The sweatshirt matched the one that Sierra was wearing in the selfie that had been taken right before she disappeared. The items were sent to a lab for testing. Ten days later, on March 28, the results of the tests came in. On Sierra's jeans, there was seminal fluid from a 21-year-old supermarket worker named Antoine Garcia Torres. He lived seven miles from Sierra's house in Maple Leaf RV Park. His girlfriend and mother lived with him. Antoine's DNA was in the system because he had been arrested before. In May 2009, he was charged with obstructing a police officer and vandalism of a jailhouse cell. He had stuffed an entire roll of toilet paper in the toilet bowl of his cell. It almost overflowed. He said that he did it because he was bored. Antoine was given five days in jail. In June 2010, he was arrested for felony battery resulting in serious bodily injury, but only convicted of a misdemeanor charge of battery. The police were pretty sure that Antoine was guilty of murdering Sierra, but they didn't want to make their move yet. Hoping that Sierra was still alive, the police conducted surveillance on Antoine. They believed that he may lead them to Sierra, but he didn't. The police also examined surveillance video from the RV park. On March 16, Antoine's red 1998 Volkswagen Jetta was captured leaving the RV park at 7 a.m. Antoine was not working that day, yet he left the RV park at the same time as if he was working. He returned to the RV park about six hours later. After seeing no indication that Antoine was going to lead them to Sierra, the police decided it was time to approach him for a conversation. They described his behavior as arrogant. They asked him if he had a relationship with the girl who had gone missing, of course referring to Sierra. His response was, I doubt it. Why? Antoine claimed that the first time he ever saw Sierra was on the news. He denied having any contact with her. Three days later, the police executed a search warrant for Antoine's residence and seized his Volkswagen Jetta. They interviewed him the same day. He spoke to them without an attorney. He said that he went fishing on March 16. When he described his movements that day, he placed himself near the route that Sierra would take to get to the bus stop. The police asked Antoine if there was any reason they would find Sierra's DNA on him he said he could only think of one way. He told the police that he regularly conducted a self-service routine, so to speak, in his motor vehicle. He kept napkins in the car to dispose of the output. He would then throw those napkins out of the window. Perhaps Sierra picked up one of those napkins. The examination of Antoine's Volkswagen Jetta led to more bad news for him. Sierra's DNA was found on the inside door handle, and her hair was found on a rope in the trunk. Antoine was arrested and charged with murder. The police believed he had committed other crimes as well. Two years earlier, near the Safeway store where Antoine worked in Morgan Hill, there had been three abduction attempts. In all three cases, the perpetrator had been frightened and ran away before completing the kidnapping. These cases were unsolved. In one attempt, the perpetrator dropped a stun gun. A partial fingerprint was recovered from the inside of the battery cover for the stun gun. The quality of the fingerprint was too low to run through the computerized matching system, but an expert was able to match it to Antoine. His trial started in January of 2017. On May 2, Antoine was found guilty of murder in connection with the death of Sierra, as well as attempted kidnapping for three other cases. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Sierra's body was never recovered. Antoine almost certainly knows where her body is, but he still maintains his innocence. If he reveals the location of her body, that would pretty much eliminate any chance Antoine would have of convincing anyone of his innocence. This brings me to the question, 
was Antoine actually guilty? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Antoine was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. During an interview with the police, Antoine placed himself near Sierra's house and her bus stop right around the time she disappeared. A number of Sierra's belongings, including her jeans, were found not far from this area. Antoine's DNA was found on her jeans. Sierra's DNA and hair were found in Antoine's vehicle. Antoine told the police that he never had contact with Sierra. Clearly, he was lying. Antoine had attempted three separate kidnappings in 2009. He was a violent and arrogant individual. Sierra had no driver's license, no credit card, no bank account, no passport, and did not have a job. Therefore, running away would be challenging. It's hard to imagine a non-criminal explanation for Sierra being in Antoine's vehicle or for his DNA being on her jeans. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Sierra's body was never recovered. She could still be alive. Sierra was not happy about moving to Morgan Hill. She talked about running away. She had a history of using marijuana and ecstasy. Right before she disappeared, she mentioned traveling to Fremont, California, to use ecstasy. Based on DNA evidence, Antoine and Sierra had been in contact, but that doesn't mean Antoine murdered Sierra. If she was murdered, someone else could have been responsible. This individual could have hidden Sierra's belongings near that shed. Maybe Antoine lied about the contact because he was afraid of charges related to sex. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Antoine was guilty? Yes, I think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I would be surprised if he ever reveals the location of Sierra's body, not only because it would prove his guilt beyond any doubt at all, but because he's arrogant and sadistic. Moving to the last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Antoine was a disturbed and violent individual. In 2012, his father was convicted of offenses related to sex and sentenced to life in prison. Antoine may have been subjected to mistreatment growing up. Eventually, he became a particularly unsophisticated criminal. At some point, Antoine drove by Sierra's bus stop and saw her standing there alone. This gave him an idea. She appeared to be an easy target. After this, he probably drove by several more times to learn her exact schedule. He knew what time she left home, what time she arrived at the bus stop, and what time the bus arrived. On March 16, Antoine left his home at 7 a.m., which gave him enough time to reach Sierra's bus stop before she arrived. Antoine approached Sierra as she was getting near the bus stop or just after she arrived. He looked around to make sure that no one else was in the area. He then kidnapped Sierra, almost certainly with the intent of committing crimes related to sex. Based on where Sierra's property was recovered, Antoine did not drive far before committing other offenses. After this, he murdered Sierra and hit her body. Now moving to my final thoughts. There's this sense with Antoine that he was eventually going to kill somebody one way or the other. It was just a matter of who and when. He started out by having angry outbursts, moved up to jail cell toilet clogging, attempted kidnapping, and finally murder. Antoine was a violent, impulsive, and creepy offender who just kept getting in trouble. He was a time bomb lurking around Morgan Hill, waiting for a victim of convenience, which unfortunately he eventually located. Those are my thoughts on the case of Sierra Lamar. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.